Okay, uh, so last time we got into uh, transition metals, and we started talking about coordination, compounds, and complex ions, and I think that's where we left off, if I'm not mistaken. So ultimately, this chapter, the rest of the left, is uh, about sort of coordination compounds. And coordination compounds really consist of uh, two things. They consist of a complex ion. And the complex ion, as we talked about, is our metal ion in the middle attached with some ligands to it, uh, and also a counter ion. And you could kind of think of a coordination compound as like an ionic compound. So like most ionic compounds, uh, we have really a positive and a negative. And always like uh, ionic compounds, our positive guy comes first and followed by our negative guy, both in the formula and also the name. And the same thing happens here. And we can have uh, both a positive or a negative complex ion. So it is possible uh, to have your complex ion come first like it does here, and that would be positive, followed by a negative counter ion to bounce it out. You obviously could have the opposite as well, a counter ion that is positive and a complex ion that is negative. Charge. Now, remember that really our sort of uh, complex ion is a metal ion in the middle. And a lot of times it's going to be our transition metal is positively charged, is sort of electron deficient. Attached to it will be a number of ligands. And remember, ligands are really Lewis bases. And that's sort of how we envision our interaction here with complex ions. It's really a Lewis acid and base situation. Uh, again, a Lewis base is something that can donate a pair of electrons. Remember, in order for it to donate a pair of electrons, it has to have some non-bonding electrons to do so. Also, it being uh, a polar molecule is really helpful. So things like water, ammonia, which have non-bonding electrons there on uh, the nitrogen or the oxygen in those cases are really good. Also, things with negative charges, so anions are really good as well. So things like chloride, uh, which has a negative charge, which means they have gained electrons are really, really well. And that's why these things are really good Lewis bases. Metals, on the other hand, have positive charges, which means they are electron deficient. Uh, so they work really well as sort of Lewis acids. They're willing to accept those electrons uh, as they come in. And remember that the sort of number of donor atoms that are attached uh, to the metal in a complex ion is what is known as the coordination number. So the coordination number again is how many atoms are directly bound to that metal remember it's not necessarily how many ligands that you have attached to it because as we talked about the ligands can be different types there could be monodentate which means that they will bind in one place per atom and that's something like water so water will bind in through say the oxygen or something like ammonia will bind in through the nitrogen here and there are some, though, that do bind in more places than one per molecule. And some of those are referred to as being bidentate. So that EN, which is the endoethyldiamine, uh, which looks, again, something like this, where once again, it's going to be those nitrogens as to where it will bind in. So again, for every one of those guys, you get a two for in terms of the coordination number. Also, oxalate is another very common example of something that will sort of do that. And it is the oxygens there where single bonded oxygens where it will bind into the metal. So um, when you look at a formula and you got like a metal and then maybe some ligands in parentheses, and sometimes people will just look at the little number on the bottom and go, that's the coordination number. Uh, it may be if it is monodentate, but if it's bidentate or something like that, you do need to adjust for the number of atoms that are attached to it. <clears throat> I think we uh, finished up last time, if I'm not mistaken, sort of talking about how to name coordination compounds. I don't think we started naming any of them, but uh, remember that when we do name these guys, there are several rules that you sort of follow. 
Uh, first rule is, like we talked about earlier, always the positive guy uh, and then the negative guy. So in terms of the complex ion, uh, we do name it a, a couple different ways, and it is dependent on whether or not the complex ion is positive or negative overall. And if the complex ion is positive, uh, then we do use just the regular name of the metal, like you normally would think of. We also remember use Roman numerals as well to indicate the charge on the metal. And we do use Roman numerals for things that sometimes we don't normally use it, like silver, zinc, and those type of guys. And I think I might have mentioned as well, it could be a situation as well where uh, the metal actually ends up with a zero oxidation state. So we sometimes they'll put zero there in parentheses uh, as well. Um, if the complex ion part is negative, then that is where you kind of roll with the old school name. And those guys usually end with the ATE at the end of it. So like ferrate for iron, cuprate for copper, uh, plumate for lead. Um, and we do still use the Roman numeral. So when you are naming the complex ion part of the compound, uh, the metal part should always come at the end of that part of the name. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will come at the end of the actual overall name, uh, but whatever part of that name that you're naming that's the complex ion part, the actual metal part with the Roman numeral should come at the end of that. In terms of the ligands, they are named in alphabetical order and using the appropriate prefixes. Remember, some of the ligands will have special names uh, depending on which ones they are, like water is aqua or aqua. Uh, NH3 is amine. Uh, so depending on what it is, you might have some interesting names. And we do use prefixes if there is more than one of those same ligands in a complex ion, which is very common. Uh, we use prefixes like di, tri, tetra, and so forth. Uh, remember that if somebody does actually have a prefix in their name to begin with, uh, like this guy here, ethyl endyl diamine, um, we actually use the, some bis, tris, or tetricus in terms of its naming. Any questions on that? And in terms of the counter ion, we uh, basically just name it uh, like normal. So a lot of times it may be a polyatomic ion. So we just use the name of the polyatomic ion. It doesn't matter how many you have of it. And then again, if it's just an element like chloride or something like that or bromide, uh, we do name it by itself. So again, a reminder that uh, these are some of the prefix names. We did go through this, yes. Okay. Um, and again, these are some of the older school ways of naming those metals. And again, we use that when the complex ion is negative. Again, here's some of the uh, ligand names and our fluorochloro, bromo, iodo, in terms of those guys. And again, these were the rules that we were just talking about basically here. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look here. All right, so if we were going to name this one, which I don't think we did, right? And it looks a little bit different than what you have on your paper. I think you might have it as a hydrate, which has a dot and maybe three waters, maybe, if you do have it. Uh, but we're going to skip the hydrate part for just a second and just kind of focus in here on the name. So when we look at this, remember that the guys in the brackets are typically your complex ion. And that would make the guy up front our counter ion. And just really by the positioning of those two things, uh, we do know that the complex ion in this case is negative because it comes second there in the formula. That means our counter ion is positive. We still want to kind of go through and maybe figure out our oxidation state there of the chromium. So we'll start with oxalate, which is minus two. And there's three of them, which gives us a minus six. Out here we have plus one and there's three of them, which gives us a plus three. So that's three and minus six, which means uh, we've got like a plus three happening there for our chromium. Um, now, because this complex ion part is negative, we're going to use chromate instead of chromium because of it being negative. So we'll start here with our counter ion, which is potassium. Here we have three, uh, which the prefix is tri. And again, uh, that is oxalate. So once again, it does have a 
different sort of name, and that is oxalato uh, when we use it. So using that there, try oxalato. This would be chromate, A-T-E, Roman numeral three. I will say oxalate is kind of an interesting one because a lot of times they will use the tris sort of prefix with it because it's bidentate. So you will sometimes see it used as potassium. Tris oxalato chromate three here. First off, any questions on that name there? <clears throat> Now, uh, if we actually did the one, I think that was on your paper, it does have a hydrate. Remember, hydrates are written uh, with that little dots there. And when we name hydrates, which is water, we do call water hydrate. And in this case, there would be three waters. So this would be something like try hydrate if we add the water in there as well. Coordination number here. Coordination number on this one is six, yes, because that is oxalate, so you get a two for one deal on that. Uh, so each of those oxalate molecules will attach to that metal in two places, giving you a coordination number there of six. So again, you have basically a chromium and you have your one oxalate molecule. Your two oxalate molecules, and I'll just draw it this way. And there we go. So one, two, three, four, five, and six basically attach that chromium. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you try some here that you got on the next page and give some proper name for the top one and formula for the bottom. And there's a list of some of more of those old school type names with the ATE for some other metals as well. All right, hang on. So let's just back up for just a second here. Feel like we started a little further back than we should have there. All right. So I think this is where we left off, huh? All right. So. <laughs> Since I sort of jumped it, let's officially talk about again the proper way to name this. Um, I thought we stopped a few slides back, but um, when we do name these coordination compounds, just so everybody's on the same page, um, again, uh, it's the positive guy first, followed by the negative anion. Um, when we do have a complex ion, um, we always name those ligands in alphabetical order. And as I mentioned, it's always the metal that comes last in the complex ion part of the name. Um, and again, that does not mean that necessarily the last part of the name will always be the complex ion or the metal part, uh, but in the part of the name where the complex ion is, is where we uh, always should have it. And it always will have a Roman numeral as well to indicate the charge on the metal. Um, we do name some of the ligands a little bit differently, so they do have some different types of names. So as I mentioned, water is aqua, uh, CO is carbonyl, uh, amine is NH3. We also do use prefixes, uh, again, to indicate the number of the same ligand that may be present. And those are di for two, tri for three, tetra for four, penta for five, and hexa for six. Um, again, if there is one that does have a prefix in its actual name, uh, like the endo ethyl diamine, uh, then we use bis, tris, or tetrakis to name it. And if that Complex ion part, as I mentioned, is negative. Then we use, again, the kind of the older school name uh, with the eight after it. Uh, so again, uh, here are some common ligand and their names. So we have aqua or aqua, some books use for water, amine for NH3, uh, methylamine there for that guy. Our uh, halogens are named very much like they do in organic. So floral, chloral, bromo, iodo for our Allergens, uh, hydroxo uh, for our hydroxide, uh, cyano for cyanide. And again, here's some of those older sort of names, ferrate, uh, cuprate, plumate, arginate, arurate, and stannate for tin. Um, 
And as I mentioned, here's a few more of those other names. So like carbonate is carbonato. Um, we have our oxalato, you know, order your beverage at Starbucks that way. Uh, we have our ethyl endyl diamine. This one again is used both in formula and name as EN. And this is actually our EDTA here. That guy at the bottom. <clears throat> So let's take a look at the two we skipped here. We we're looking at oxidation numbers, so I don't think we did either here. I think that's actually where we did lay up. So uh, let's first start with uh, this here. Make sure you assign the oxidation numbers for each of these, and also what is the coordination numbers for each of these. And then we'll talk about that and we'll talk about naming these again and seeing how it works. OK, let's take a look since we kind of skipped ahead and then came back. Uh, let's first start with the question here, which is what is the oxidation number of the metal? And that metal is the one that's in the complex ion. So again, when we see these brackets here, that tells us that this is our complex ion part. It's typically in those brackets. Uh, that would make this our counter ion here. So to figure out our oxidation state, we just got to kind of go through it. Hydroxide is minus one, and there's four of them, which makes it minus four overall. We do have our counter ion on the outside, which is plus one. So in this case, the oxidation state here on our gold uh, should be a plus three in this case. Question on that one there. <clears throat> coming over here, we actually see our complex ion coming first here in the formula. This would make this guy here our counter ion. And once again here, looking at NH3, the oxidation state there is zilch on that. On the outside, our counter ion is nitrate, which is minus one, and there's three of them, which gives us a minus three. So in this case, our chromium is going to be plus three. Not always going to be plus three, but it happens to be in both of these cases. First off, any questions on the oxidation state there? <clears throat> the coordination number on the first one is... Coordination number here is... Four. Each of the hydroxides are monodentate, which means that they will attach the gold one per molecule. So that will give us a coordination number four. Over here, the coordination number here will be six in this case. And that is again because the NH3 is also monodentate, uh, which means for every time that it attaches, it attaches through the nitrogen one per molecule and there's six of them which basically means we got six nitrogens attached to that metal any question on the coordination number or the oxidation state all right so since we sort of jumped gun there talking about naming and we went back let's actually name these two here and again just to illustrate how we go about it first off i know for sure just by looking at the formula that my complex ion is negative and if we did, in this case, just look at the complex ion part of it, that is again negative one, which is negative four, that's a plus three. That means really my complex ion here is carrying an overall charge of minus one. And that is why when I look at my counter ion here, I just need one potassium to balance that out. So plus one and minus one gets a zero, just like an ionic compound. If I look at my complex ion on the right, I know that it is positive because it comes first in the formula. And if I just isolate the complex ion part by itself, again, that is zero, that is plus three as we figured out. That means that is a plus three charge that we have going on there for our complex ion. That is why we need not one, not two, but we actually need three of these nitrates where they're each negative one. Gives us a negative three overall to balance out that positive three charge. So again, that's sort of how we get to each of those things. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so in terms of naming, we could approach it uh, straightforward here since we already pretty much worked out everything. Our counter ion is pretty much just going to be named like normal. Uh, so if we had something like KCL, it would be potassium chloride. So 
our counter ion here is just going to be potassium. Again, it does not matter how many of those counter ions you have. You would just call it potassium. And if you had a negative uh, anion there, that's just an element. Uh, you would just be IDE at the end of it, regardless of how many you have. Now, in terms of what we got going here, we do have a ligand, which is hydroxide, and we have four of them. So if we take a look at our little chart here, and we can find hydroxide right there, and that is hydroxo is how we're going to name that. So going back here, four is tetra, hydroxo, and now we know that this is negative, the complex ion. So that means that we do not use gold, but we do need to use sort of the older name there with the eight. So we would roll with R U rate here for gold because the complex ion part is negative. So to finish up that name here, R U rate and Roman numeral three. So that is potassium tetrahydroxo RU rate three. And here the metal part comes at the end of the name uh, like we would expect. And it happens to be at the end of the complex ion part name and also the end of the whole name in this case. First off, any questions on that? Yeah. That's all one word, the back end of it, tetrahydroxo RU rate three. And then the potassium is a separate word up up front, yeah. The questions on that? Okay, so looking at our second one here, if we were going to name it properly, uh, we're going to start with the complex ion. And in this case, we can use chromium here because our complex ion is positive. So we can just use the regular name. In this case, we have six, which is hexa. I'll just go this way. And NH3, if you look at that chart, or any of those charts there are right here is a mean. So we're going to borrow that there. So this can be hexa amine. And again, this would be chromium Roman numeral three. And again, even though we have multiple sort of polyatomic ions there, we just use the name of the polyatomic ion. Uh, so that would be nitrate. So this would be hexamine chromium three nitrate as the name of this guy. Now, if we did have more than one ligand here and we were naming it, uh, which is, for example, let's just say we did have more than one in this guy, uh, we would look at the name of the ligand and not the prefix. So when you're putting in alphabetical order, you ignore the prefix and go with just the first letter of the ligand uh, to put them in alphabetical order. First off, any questions on that there? Now, if we had just the complex ion by itself, like this guy, the name of this guy would be everything here without the potassium. And then normally you would just put ion at the end of it. Yeah. And same idea here. If we had just the complex ion by itself, pretty much this would be our name and just slap ion at the end of it if we just have the complex ion by itself. So sometimes you are going to name just the ion by itself and you basically follow the same rules. You just kind of put ion at the end because you don't have a counter ion or you don't have a counter ion obviously at the beginning in that particular case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, now that we officially talked about it, now go back to those and <laughs> name them properly hopefully. So we are on this guy. All right, so the top one, let's do a name, and bottom one, let's do the proper formula and see what you come up with here. Okay, let's take a look and see. So once again, uh, just looking at the formula, got in our brackets here with the transition metal, going to be our complex ion. And once again here, the CL will be our counter ion. And really, again, just from the positioning, we do know that the complex ion part is going to be positive as it comes first. That means we can just use chromium instead of chromate. We might want to figure out the oxidation state here. So water there is zero. Uh, that's going to be a negative one. There's two of them. 
and we also have them one more negative one on the outside. So once again, here we did get a plus three. Once again, won't always be plus three, but happens to be in this case. We have a couple of ligands going on here, different ones in this case. So we have water, uh, which is aqua or aqua, whichever way you like to do it. There's four of them, which means that's a tetra aqua or tetra aqua. There are two of the chlorines, uh, which becomes chloral. So that's a dichloral situation. And then obviously we have chromium Roman numeral three happening here. We want to go alphabetical here in our ligands first. So alphabetical, once again, ignoring the prefix means we are going to actually take the tetra aqua first as A is before C. So that's going to be tetra aqua or aqua, whichever way you like to do it, dichloral. Again here, the metal part comes at the end of the complex ion name, in this case, chromium Roman numeral three. Again, um, we're going to use the whole name there, a regular name because it's positive. Now what's left is just our counter ion here. And just like if we had NaCl, it would be sodium chloride. Uh, same thing here, this would be chloride at the end, yeah. So a little tetra aqua dichloral chromium three chloride. Rolls right off the tongue, I think, yes. Any questions on Good thing I got a wide screen to write all this on. All right, so we're actually going to do the uh, formula here. And in this case, we have tris ethyl endyl diamine. Uh, that is our EN guy. That is the one I drew the other moment ago, which is this bidentate situation happening here. And in the case of this actual name, it already has a prefix in it. Uh, which is why they use those other sort of prefixes like tris, bis, tetricus, if you have that kind of Greek prefix going on already. Uh, but tris means three, and we do have three of those. So once again, you can either write the formula out, but again, most people will just put the en even in the formula uh, for it, and we would have a three. Cobalt with a Roman numeral of something, too, looks like, uh, means that's a cobalt with a plus two charge. So that's really our complex ion part all the way up to here. I know that because once again, the metal always comes at the end of the complex ion part of the name. Uh, so basically, if we do a little boxing of that, that's CO, we got the EN3. Now it's helpful, obviously, at this point to figure out what is your overall charge on your complex ion, so you know how many of those counter ions you need. So in this case, EN is neutral. And we figured out the cobalt there is plus two. That means really here the complex ion has a plus two charge. And that's important because sulfate is minus two, which means you just need one of those guys. Maybe the S closer to it will make it bigger. And now we really can put it all together to give us COEN3 and a SO4 in this particular case. Any questions on that there? So it's important to sort of put your complex ion, and in most cases, people will write the complex ion like I showed you here in the bracket. And most cases, they do the metal first, followed by really alphabetical order. In a lot of cases, the ligands kind of after it. And again, finding out the overall charge of complex ion allows you to know how many of your counter ions that you need in this particular case. Any questions on either of those? By the way, coordination number, the top one is. Top one is six. Yes, we have four of these guys and two of those guys are each monodentate, which means they bind one per molecule. Uh, coordination number of this guy is also six because there are three of them and each of them can bind in two places. So that gives you six donor atoms. So the coordination number there would be six. This is an example, as I was talking about earlier, sometimes people just roll straight up with the little subscript there and go, that's the coordination number, and it will be correct if it is just a monodentate, but in this case, it's a bidentate, so you got to adjust it to get the correct coordination number. Any questions on those two? All right, let's do a couple more because, hey, it's fun with naming day. That's the best name. All right. All right, give the names of both of these guys the proper names.
All right, let's take a look. Uh, so once again, uh, we got our complex ion coming first here. Means it is positive because it does come first. That's going to be our counter ion. That also means we could use just uh, cobalt here for the name. Uh, to figure out the charge, once again, NH3 is zero. Uh, that is minus one for the chloride. And we also have a minus one on the outside. And there's two of them, which gets us to a minus two, a minus three, and a plus three happening here. So uh, we will go in terms of our ligands. We have five of the ammonia. So that is penta amine. We also have one of the chlorides, so that's going to be a chloral. And obviously we have cobalt Roman numeral three. So alphabetical here, A before C, ignoring the prefix. So that's going to be a gay penta amine chloral. And that would then be a cobalt Roman numeral three. And once again here, even though we have multiples of our counter ion, it's just going to be named kind of like normal, and that would be chloride. Yeah. Any question on that name there? <clears throat> Looking at the bottom one, uh, we see our complex ion down here on the second part of the name. Uh, so right off the bat, I know it's negative, which means I have to go with ferrate instead of iron because that is the negative version that we need. Uh, in terms of the charge, CN is CN minus, which is minus one. So that's a minus six on the outside on our counter ion here. Uh, we got a plus one happening in three of them, which is a plus three. So we got plus three and minus six. Again, going to give us an iron three. Once again, we did run into a batch of plus threes. They won't all be plus threes, obviously. Our counter ion here is going to be named just like normal, regardless of how many of them you have. So that would just be potassium. Same idea, see like you had K2O, that would be potassium oxide. So again, it doesn't really matter how many you have. No prefixes added to the counter ion. Uh, here we're going to go with hexa, which is six, and cyanide is cyano. And then that's going to be a ferrate Roman numeral three. Again, metal part at the end of the complex ion part of the name, just like it is here, although it's not the last part of the overall name, it isn't the last part of the complex ion part of the name. Any question on either of those there? <clears throat> Coordination number on both of these is six. Top guy's got five ammonias and one chloride, so that's six. They're all monodentate. And coordination number on the bottom one, also six, as CN minus is also uh, monodentate as well. All right, finish up. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so once again, just looking at the name, I know my complex ion part runs to there as the metal part should come at the end. Also see that it is a positive guy. And uh, after that would be our counter ion here. So really just going to kind of build the parts here. We have triamine and amine is NH3 and tri is three of them. That takes care of kind of that part of it. Uh, bromo is a bromide. And obviously we have a platinum that is a plus two. So kind of putting our complex ion part here together, we would end up with something that looks like this. Three and a BR. In this particular case, we want to kind of figure out what our overall charge is on the complex ion. Uh, so we know this guy is plus two. Uh, this guy is zero and that is minus one. That means we have a plus one overall sort of charge on the complex ion. And that is good because chloride is minus one, which means we just need one of them. So really putting those together to make our coordination compound, we're going to get rid of the charges and just slide everybody together. And we're going to end up with something that looks like this here. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> coordination number on this guy is four. Monodentate three of them and monodentate one of them, so there would be those four guys directly attached to the platinum in this particular case. Any questions on that there? All right, looking here at potassium, that's my counter ion. I know that this part back here is my complex ion because it has the metal and the Roman numeral going on. So counter ion is K plus, 
and Hexa is six, and F is fluorine, and Cobalt with a plus three charge. So once again, putting it together, we got something that looks like this. That's a plus three. That is a minus one. There's six of them. So this guy is hanging out here with a minus three overall charge. And that's important because I don't need one of these guys, not two, but I do need three of them to balance out the charge, which means K3COF6 in this case. Yeah. Coordination number here would be six as fluorine is monodentate or fluoride is monodentate. The question on how to write the formula, how to name these guys, how to figure out oxidation numbers, coordination numbers. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, so uh, we're going to continue on talking about uh, the idea of isomers and complex ions, uh, which is fun, maybe. So let's talk about isomers. And isomers are really things, as it says down here, uh, they they really have the same formula, but there is different connectivity that sometimes occurs and different leakages, and it gives rise to different sort of characteristics or properties depending on how they're sort of put together. They're sort of broken up into two classes of isomers. There are structural isomers, uh, which has coordination isomers, or linkage isomers, which we're going to look at in just a second. And there's also sort of a branch which are referred to as stereo isomers. And those also have uh, ones that are referred to as geometric isomers, which are cis or trans, and also some optical isomers, which are able to move sort of plain polarized light. So we're going to first look at sort of structure isomers and some of the differences here. And this is a coordination isomer, which is a structure isomer. And the difference here is really what is attached to the complex ion and what is acting as the counter ion in this case. And in the first case up here, the bromine or bromide is the counter ion. And in this case, we basically have the chromium attached to the five ammonias through the nitrogen, not drawn perfectly here, but we'll do it that way. And we also have the sulfate there attached. And this overall thing, if we look at it in terms of the charge, uh, the sulfate is minus two and the chromium is plus three uh, so it's a plus one charge and we have one br minus that's happening there to balance it out basically is what's happening so in the bottom one although it has again the exact same sort of elements and everybody involved in this case though the bromine is not acting as a counter ion it's actually the sulfate in this case as the counter ion and in this case, we actually have the chromium that's still attached to our five ammonias through the nitrogen. And in this case, we actually have the bromine that's attached, different than what we have up here, which is the sulfate. And also because the bromine's attached, it actually does change the overall charge here. Chromium is plus three. The bromide is minus one, which means this guy is carrying a plus two charge. And that's why we just need one of the sulfate in this case, actually, to balance it out in this particular case. So a coordination isomer it differs in what is sort of part of the complex ion and what is sort of the counter ion in this case. Everything else is really the same. Uh, they both really have a coordination number of six in each of these cases. Just sort of in one case, the sulfate part of the complex ion, and in the other case, it is the bromide there that is part of the complex ion. Any question on? They have exactly the same elements there: one chromium in each, five of the NH3s, one SF4, and one Br in each of them. So they are isomers of each other because they share the same formula, really, or characteristics, uh, but they have different characteristics because of the way they are attached. Another sort of uh, structural isomer has to do with the actual ligand itself. Now, there can be a ligand that is, say, monodentate, but does have the ability to attach with multiple or different, I don't say multiples at a time, but it can attach with different elements to the central metal. And those are what are referred to as linkage isomers. So looking at NO2 minus as an example, in the top one here, it is the nitrogen that is actually directly attaching to the metal in the middle. 
On the bottom one is still the NO2 as the ligand, but the attachment point is coming from the oxygen, which has a lone pair on it, or the nitrogen, which has a lone pair. They are not both attaching at the same time like a bidentate can, but what we have here is an option of either a nitrogen and oxygen sort of donating those electrons because they both have the ability to do so. And because in the top case, obviously the nitrogen is directly attached versus the oxygen on the bottom does give slightly different sort of characteristics. And also they are considered isomers of each other. They're not the exact same thing because of the different connection point that we have with that particular ligand. In question on linkage isomers. <laughs> Now, the other sort of class of isomers uh, has to do with uh, sort of how they are attached to each other. And these are geometric isomers. And geometric isomers give rise to what are referred to as cis or trans isomers. And in general, cis means the same side. And trans means the opposite sides. And in organic chemistry, you'll see a lot of those. In organic chemistry, it's really easy evolving a carbon-carbon double bond. Either the same groups on the same side of the double bond or they're on opposite sides of the double bond, which would be trans versus cis, which would be the same side of double bond. Here, though, in sort of complex ions, we look at sort of uh, same side or opposite sides of like the main plane of the molecule. Here, they're kind of on the same or they're on opposite sides. Uh, they have the same atoms, the same bonds. Because of the different arrangements and angles, uh, they do give uh, sort of different properties. They're very common in square planar. Square planar is kind of like what it sounds like. Uh, a square there in a the plane. That's like your expanded octet geometry you talked about maybe last semester. Uh, that's also a coordination number of four, if you remember that. I don't know, maybe. So here's an example. Uh, this is a coordination number four. And in here, this whole thing is obviously the same plane. And we do see the chlorines again on the same side. You could also look at the ammonia, which also is on really the same side in that particular case. And that would be the cis arrangement again, same side. Now this guy on the bottom is the exact same formula. For fact, they are identical to formulas for both of these guys. And if we look, though, the chlorines are basically opposites of each other, sort of on opposite sides, and that would be the trans. You could also look in this case at the ammonias, which are also on opposite sides. So when you're comparing cis or trans, you usually are looking for a group that's the same, that you're comparing where their location is. A ligand is either on the same side or opposite side. Uh, that happens here, which would give us the trans down here. Now, we could also see this as a coordination number six, which is sometimes the octahedral arrangement. And with this, we sort of look like here, this is a coordination number six. Uh, we're looking actually at the chlorine and sort of uh, this is the plane of the molecule. So this chlorine and this chlorine is kind of up above and below, sort of opposite sides of the main plane of the molecule. And that would be our trans. And if we look here again within this plane of the molecule, they're sort of both on the same side, kind of both up, if you will, kind of that three dimensional. And this would be our cis location. Uh, again, they both have identical formulas, but because of the locations of those groups, uh, they will have some different sort of properties that can attach. Now, optical isomers are isomers that have opposite effects on plane polarized light. You could kind of rotate plane polarized right light. I'll spit that out. Uh, I could even measure the angle if you really want to. Uh, but basically, uh, we oftentimes, when we talk about isomers, talk about uh, the idea of, of a chiral molecule. And a chiral molecule is one where the mirror image is non superimposable. So if it is the chiral molecule, uh, if you put your guy up to a mirror and you take out the mirror image, it is non-superimposable. You can rotate as much as you want. It will never fit perfectly on top of the original guy. It is like your hand. If you put your hand up to the mirror, you get your other hand, right? If you take your other hand out, you can do as much rotation as you want. You'll never get it to sit perfectly. My thumbs are on the wrong side, right? Even though they're both palm, palm down. Thumbs on the right side, but one's palm down, one's palm up. It doesn't fit. You could play it with yourself. Don't hurt yourself twisting your arms or anything like that. Uh, but it'll never perfectly fit on top of each other. And those are usually chiral molecules is what that means. There are something referred to as achiral, 
which has mirror images that you actually can pull out the mirror image and it actually will sit perfectly right on top of each other. Uh, the ones that do not superimpose Richard Carl are also sometimes referred to as being in antimers of each other. Uh, plain polarized light, we just shoot it through a sort of a filter, it goes in both directions. And like I said, you can, can measure the angle. We're not going to get into any of that, obviously, in this particular case. There's our hands, right? And again, these two hands here will never fit perfectly on top of each other with everything going in the correct direction. Uh, so they are chiral of each other. So let's take a look at this and sort of uh, try to illustrate uh, the difference here. And I sort of scribbled on it very badly here. But uh, if we look at our original guy, I don't think I, so uh, if we look at this here, this is our original guy and we're going to reflect into this mirror when we reflect by the way this guy kind of ends up uh, there uh, that guy ends up there this guy obviously ends up in the top here uh, and then these guys actually end up back here so these guys here get reflected into the back upon doing so what happens is in the original structure there is this connection between these two guys these two nitrogens in this case but as it gets reflected in the mirror image, that bond now gets stretched all the way across to the backside. So when we pull this image out, there's always going to be that wrong connection between those two nitrogens, and you can rotate that as much as you want. It's never going to fit perfectly on top of this original image of each other uh, because of that different connection. So in the first one, it's up front, and then in that mirror image, that connection gets shoved to the back. So as you rotate, it will never fit perfectly on each other. Now, so if we look at this one here, this one's actually a uh, trans uh, isomer. And when this gets reflected, again, if we kind of zoom in, uh, that's going to get reflected there, there, and then these guys are going to go to the back, if you will. But when it does so, it's still able to maintain the exact same connection between those two nitrogens as it originally had. So that means when you do pull it out of that mirror image, you'll be able to put it on there because everything basically maintain the same bonds that it has. Again, this is the one we were just looking at where that original bond to the front ends up being reflected to the nitrogen in the back. So as you pull that guy out again and with rotation, it's not going to work so well. A lot of times trans guys will fit nicely in the mirror image because of that. Uh, cis guys not so much because you always get sort of a different sort of bond that happens in that reflection when it goes into the mirror any questions on that there sometimes really hard to sort of visualize and sometimes draw on it sometimes can help now two molecules that are mirror images of each other non-superimposable as i mentioned are sometimes referred to as enantiomers uh, sometimes one of the isomers for example can have very different properties than another a lot of drugs are chiral as well, but one of the isomers not as effective as the other uh, because, again, of some of those different properties because of the different connections that occur. Any questions on that there? All right, the uh, last thing we're going to talk about here is the electrons. And when we talked about sort of electron configuration of our transition metals at the beginning of this chapter, uh, we're going to talk about how electrons get distributed in those d orbitals. Um, when we have our complex ions that come together with our ligands. And in this case, it has to do with some of the bonding theory comes into play a little bit. So a reminder that hybrid orbitals are mixtures of atomic orbitals. So that's like things like SP, right? SP2, SP3, SP3D, SP3D2 are squared. These guys relate to geometries, as you might remember, that is two letters, which is two electron pairs, so that is linear. That is three letters, so that is trigonal planar, our triangular. That is four letters, that's our favorite tetrahedral geometry. This is five letters, which is triangular bipyramidal. And that is six letters, which is octahedral. So we do see some of these geometries sort of come by when we're dealing with our complex ions. 
Uh, the interaction, though, of our complex ions are basically assumed to be, as we've been talking about, more of a Lewis acid base situation where we're having those electrons being sort of donated by the ligands to our electron deficient um, metals. And that's what we see here again, in this case, NH3 really sort of donating off its electrons to our definitely electron deficient sort of cobalt in this case. So some of these geometries uh, do relate to the coordination number. So for coordination number four, we actually have two types of geometries. It is the tetrahedral, like kind of like uh, Vesper there for electron pairs, four bonds, if you will. Uh, we also have our square planar that we just saw, which would be more of the expanded octet is kind of where you get into that guy, where you have square planar, square pyramidal, but coordination number four. This is usually a coordination number two, which is our linear sort of geometry uh, that occurs with it. So in a lot of cases, those coordination numbers, again, do relate to some different geometries. And sometimes when you're dealing with a complex ion, they'll say, hey, assume that it has tetrahedral geometry or square planar geometry or if it's a coordination number six, I uh, will usually just be assumed that it is octahedral. But definitely if it has coordination number four, they'll oftentimes tell you sort of the geometry as either being tetrahedral or square planar when you do it. And obviously these are our pictures of those guys, uh, just like when we had our geometry there. So when we do get our metal in the middle of our complex ion. Our transition metals is the d orbitals, right? Or d electrons, as we talked about. And that is where it starts, right? 3d, 4d, 5d. So it's all about the d electrons here. And there are five different d electrons, or x, y, or y, z, x, z, x squared, x squared, y squared. And in the absence of any ligand being present, all five of those d orbitals are pretty much the same energy level. So they're all perfectly on the same energy level. And that's important in terms of how electrons populate d orbitals, right? They populate them lowest energy level first, right? And then they come back and fill up, right? So one at a time and kind of come back and fill up that it's Hund's rule and Pauli exclusion rule as to which way that they go. What actually happens though, when we start to get some ligands involved in the formation of complex ion is there's actually some splitting that occurs uh, between the different d orbitals. And these are the d orbitals and the electrons that come from the transition metal that's in the middle of your complex ion. And in this case, we're actually looking at like a coordination number here of six, and this is the octahedral splitting that occurs. And in this case, we actually get three of our d orbitals in a lower energy level, and we get two of our d orbitals in a higher energy level. And that difference in those energy there of those two sets of d orbitals is what's referred to as crystal field splitting, sometimes abbreviated with a little delta symbol, and it is the energy basically. And it's really that energy difference between the lower d orbitals and the higher d orbitals in a metal that's involved in a complex ion. So why is this important? This is important because electrons will populate these metals differently depending on what ligands are present. So in a situation where perhaps the splitting part here is not a big energy difference between them, what will happen is the electrons will come in and then decide, eh, that's not too bad, we'll come up here next and then we'll come back through and start pairing people off. Uh, if the sort of energy difference between the lower d orbitals and the higher d orbitals aren't that big, that's the sort of pattern that's going to happen. Now, if they get through here and decide that we have a really big sort of splitting that's occurring, what's gonna happen in terms of how they fill the electrons is they will go one at a time and decide that's like way too much energy there to go upwards. So we're just gonna fill up the bottom here first until we're forced to kind of go to the top. So you will get a difference in how the electrons will fill depending on sort of what ligands are present and how these things split. And <clears throat> this will result in either a complex ion having a lot of unpaired electrons, which is referred to as being paramagnetic, or it may have a lot more paired electrons, which can mean it's more diamagnetic 
and it will have some different properties because of either it has sort of more unpaired electrons or uh, more paired electrons. Any questions on that there? Now, when we do uh, any type of uh, spectrophotometry, we have done this before, right? We always want to get that maximum wavelength, right, of absorption. And we can actually calculate the crystal field splitting by using this equation that you probably have seen before. That is the change in energy is equal to H times the frequency. Uh, it is also related to another equation that's helpful here. C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. C being the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. This being the wavelength, which is meters. This being the frequency, which is reciprocal seconds or hertz. It's the same as a reciprocal second. And this is H, which is Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And again, that is our frequency and reciprocal seconds right here. Now, if you know the frequency of light, right, you can figure out the energy difference that happens, but a lot of times we are up the wavelength perhaps of the photon. So as you may remember, if you solve for the frequency, that is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, which means if you substitute that into here, you get the energy is equal to HC divided by the wavelength. So if you just know the wavelength, uh, you can figure out the energy difference, and in this case would be the crystal field splitting between them. Um, you do want to watch units. This needs to be in meters to do that because uh, obviously that's in meters as well. So sometimes the wavelength is given to you in nanometers. We're going to uh, continue on here where we left off. So we we're talking about sort of last thing in this chapter, which is about really the sort of uh, distribution of electrons in the d orbitals of these transition metals in the complex ions. And we do get this, as I mentioned before, it was referred to as crystal field splitting. And that is the splitting of the d orbitals uh, within the transition metal, again, affecting how the electrons basically get populated in there. And this occurs when we do have those ligands present. Uh, without them, again, all five of these d orbitals would be basically on the same energy level. Um, we just talked about there at the end uh, a couple of equations maybe from the past that we could also use to uh, calculate the crystal field splitting energy. Um, and let's take a look at an example which I think has worked out for you. So we'll just talk about sort of the calculation here uh, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Good talk. Let's go back. Uh, but first off here, we have a, a maximum absorption of a complex ion that occurs at uh, 470 nanometers. We're looking for what color the complex uh, ion would be and also what is the energy of the crystal field splitting in kilojoules per mole. So I think we talked about this a number of times throughout the semester uh, when we did especially some of those spectrophotometry type of experiments uh, where we got the absorbance values. Remember that the color that we actually do see is the complementary color to the wavelength of light that's being absorbed. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, we have uh, this complex ion, which is absorbing light in the 470 region, which is here. That means that really the color that we will see is the complementary color to it, which in this case is obviously orange. Uh, and again, that's why, for example, when we did that experiment way back when, when we did the equilibrium experiment, our solutions were red. But again, when we set the wavelength, uh, we were in the kind of this area here, probably the greenish area in terms of the wavelength. Again, the color that we see is the complementary color to the light being absorbed. In this particular case, if we wanted to do the crystal field splitting, we would use our equations that we were just talking about, which is our H times the frequency. And again, more so in this case, we would use HC divided by the wavelength, as that is really the only piece of information that was given to us. We do have to be careful of our units here. As we talked about earlier, that's in nanometers, and obviously the speed of light is in meters per second. So because of the units of this guy, meters, you do need to get this guy into meters so that all those meter type units will cancel. And that is what they did down here, uh, converting that nano by taking the times 10 to the minus nine uh, to convert it into meters. 
that will give us really the crystal field splitting here of 4.23 times 10 to the minus 19. Again, these are really constant. So that's our Planck's constant. That's our speed of light. And this is really 4.23 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per atom. And here we're looking really for kilojoules per mole. So you might recognize our friend Avogadro and his number. So we're going to use Avogadro's number here to convert the atoms into moles. So essentially, we just looked at the units at this point, joules per atom. Then obviously we would use Avogadro's number 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole. The atoms would cancel. That would give us joules per mole. And then obviously we could divide by a thousand and convert it into kilojoules per mole. So in this case, if you use that equation, it equals H times the frequency. That will give you basically how many joules there is per atom. And again, a lot of times you want it per mole. So you got to use that kind of Avogadro's number as a conversion factor to do that. And obviously just dividing by a thousand there would get us into kilojoules as there is a thousand joules in a kilojoule. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> kind of a throwback calculation, maybe. Yeah. All right, so let's get back into how do we know when we do have these ligands attached and how big or how small that splitting is going to be. Again, a reminder that what we are looking at here is the characteristic splitting for an octahedral complex and coordination number of six, uh, where we get those guys on the bottom and the other guys on the top. We can look at the spectral chemical series and it's basically just a bunch of ligands and it will give us sort of whether or not it is a strong field or a weak field sort of splitting that occurs. So kind of all these guys this way is what is referred to as strong field. And what that means is when we look at just the three versus two sort of D orbitals there, you know, or X, Y or yz or xz and our z squared and our x squared y squared and z squared what that means is in a strong field this is going to be relatively a large basically splitting that's going to occur and because of that how electrons will go into here is they will go here they will go here they will go here and decide that is too big of a split to go to the top I much rather come down and fill these guys out first. The result of that is obviously we're going to end up with a lot more paired electrons. Then if we had some of these guys on this end, which is reconfigured a weak field ligand, and if we were looking at the separation of those guys, we would have a much smaller split between them. So as the electrons go into here, they will go one, two, three and decide well, that's not too bad. We'll just kind of fill it up kind of like normal and then come back and obviously start pairing off. Here we end up with a much smaller separation and that's what is referred to as weak fill. We also end up with a couple of characteristics of complex ions in terms of how they're described is on the left hand side here. We have a lot more unpaired electrons, so paramagnetic. This is also sometimes referred to as a high spin complex high spin because it has a lot of unpaired electrons. Over here where we have a lot more paired up electrons, uh, that is what is sometimes referred to as a low spin complex. Again, a lot more paired electrons in this case. Now, in terms of sort of the guys in the middle, it can in some cases go either way. And a lot of times what will happen is uh, they may tell you to do it one way or the other in terms of drawing it. They may say, hey, do it for the high spin complex or do it for the low spin complex or weak field or strong field. So a lot of times in the middle, uh, they will oftentimes sort of give you some information about how you should do it. There's also going to be times where it really will not matter. So you could do high spin or low spin. It really wouldn't matter. So for example, if I had, say, some D electrons and there's only three of them, it really doesn't matter high spin or low spin, right? Because they're just going to populate the bottom, right? So it doesn't really matter. It'll come out the same. And even high spin or low spin, uh, even with more electrons, you could potentially end up with the same number of unpaired electrons, depending on which way you go. So if you see something where they really don't kind of give you that information, or it's kind of in the middle of left or right here, 
Um, it probably doesn't matter which way you do it. You know, it'll kind of come out the same. And those are the common sort of questions that are sometimes asked on these. Uh, you're asked to draw these guys with the arrows in the boxes, and you're oftentimes asked, you know, how many unpaired electrons would that complex ion sort of have um, in terms of the sort of the question. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so let's take a look at one here. We'll do this one here together. We'll do the top one. We'll do our nickel uh, BR6. And if we look at this guy here, first a couple of things that we want to kind of figure out is what is the oxidation state there of the nickel? So the BR is minus one. And there's six of them, which gives us a minus six. Overall, it's a minus two, which means the nickel here is rolling with a plus four oxidation state. Now, if we look at nickel on the periodic table, that's number 28. And if we do nickel with an I with no charge, that's going to be 28. That would be an argon 4s2, as we talked about at the beginning of this chapter, and like two, four, six, eight, three D8. As we talked about earlier, when this nickel now has a plus four charge, it will have 24 electrons. And when transition metals lose electrons, as we talked about, it's always the S electrons to get lost first. So that's going to be two. That means we also need to take out two electrons out of there to get the four. And that's going to give us uh, for nickel with a plus four charge, argon 3D6. Now, electron configuration is important for this because it is those six electrons that are in that nickel that we have to distribute throughout the sort of D orbitals and how they're going to distribute. First off, any questions on electron configuration there? All right, so we want to basically distribute these guys. So we want to figure out a couple things. First off, uh, the coordination number here is six, which means this is going to be a little octahedral action happening. And that is important because that's going to give us the splitting pattern that we've been looking at, which is basically these three guys on the bottom and these two guys up on top. So we definitely know that. So we'll just uh, draw it up there. Now that we have our splitting pattern, the other thing that we want to look at is the ligand here. And the ligand is BR, which if we come over here, we see BR over on this side, uh, which tells us it is a weak field ligand, which means the separation between the lower d orbitals and the higher d orbitals are not going to be that big. So that's going to be a weak field. So as we go to distribute our electrons here, we will have one electron, two electrons, three electrons. And these again are the D electrons we're distributing here. Four electrons because it's not so big, five electrons and lucky number six right about there. This guy ends up with a number of electrons that are unpaired is four unpaired electrons. Has a lot more unpaired electrons than paired electrons. This would be considered a high spin complex here, yeah? A lot more unpaired electrons. Any questions on that distribution there? All right, then why don't you try the other three that we got going on here, draw the diagrams, how many unpaired electrons we got going on. So do it for uh, this guy, this guy, and this guy. And for the fluorine, you could do weak field for that guy. And uh, the iron is 24. Still, I think the EN is zero oxidation state or charge, uh, which means here the nickel has got to also be plus four. So since we kind of already did that guy, we will roll with our same six electrons. In this case, though, we do have EN. If we look over here, EN is a little bit towards the strong side there. So we're going to do it for strong fill. So if we do that, once again, we're going to get the same three two split here. But once again, that's going to be strong field, which means uh, we're going to have a larger separation. And that means that as we distribute these uh, six electrons, we'll go here, 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 and then it will decide it's too high to go up there. So we're going to actually fill down here. And that means we end up with 
zero unpaired electrons. And that should also be a low spin situation in this case. Uh, again, as you can see here, both of those complex ions have the exact same nickel, the exact same charge, but because of the presence of different ligands, we get a different distribution of those unpaired electrons or electrons. And again, we end up with a more higher com spin complex versus a low spin complex, uh, which will affect some of the properties, obviously, of that complex ion. Any questions on that one there? That was obviously this guy we just did. Yeah. All right, then let's take a look at our iron setup here. Uh, iron's 26. And in this case, if we look at iron on the top guy, that's minus one, that's minus six, and that's a minus three. So iron here is rolling with a plus three charge, uh, which means it should have 23 electrons. Once again, the iron will get rid of its 4s electrons, and that will leave us uh, 2, 4, 6, I think 3d5, if I counted right there, I hope, um, <clears throat> in this particular case. That means we have five electrons that we need to distribute coming from the iron. And in this case here, coordination number also six and here as well six and this guy is also a coordination number of six as that is by dentate that guy which is why we did our octahedral splitting in this particular case we will get our octahedral splitting we already decided to do weak field for this which means the splitting will be a little bit smaller here so as we distribute our five electrons one two three four and five in this case so five unpaired electrons, definitely going to be a high spin situation going on here. And that is obviously this guy right there. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> and lastly, looking at this guy, this is minus one. Uh, that's minus six overall. We have a minus three, so the iron here is still plus three. So the iron will still have those five electrons that need to be distributed. Looking at our ligand, which is cyanide, that is definitely in the strong field sort of range. So if we do our octahedral splitting, we'll do it dramatically here as a strong field. And in this case, as we distribute our five electrons, one, two, three, four and five as they decide that this is too big of a hill to climb that is going to leave us with just one unpaired electron a lot more paired electrons a lot more diamagnetic and also low spin once again here both of those iron complexes had the exact same iron with the exact same charge again it is that presence of that ligand which kind of determines how things are going to split and also how basically the electrons would be distributed here any questions on crystal field splitting? So those are common questions is like draw it, how many unpaired electrons, low spin, high spin, and also obviously the calculation we did previously to figure out the energy of it. Any questions on that? <clears throat> now what we have been looking at is specifically the crystal field splitting for octahedral complexes, which has a coordination number of six. But when we do change the coordination number and have some different geometries, coordination number four and say two, for example, we do get some different splitting that occurs. So let's take a look at the tetrahedral splitting. And actually here's, an, here's a picture of all the sort of high spin on the left, low spin on the right, complexes for our octahedral uh, complexes and our different combinations depending on the electrons. When we get to tetrahedral, this would be a coordination number of four. And we get basically the same splitting, except that it's flipped. So the three that were on the lower energy in the first one are now the higher energy, and those guys that were the higher energy are now the lower energy. And it does work the same way. We would fill our lower electrons first, and then if it is a strong field, it would not go up. It would stay low and fill these guys until it needed to go up and then fill up one at a time. If we had a weak field just like we did on the previous one it would feel like normal uh, again we would always start with the lowest energy which means it would come here here and if it was a weak field 
would not have a problem roll up this way and then again come back down and start pairing off so uh almost kind of like the opposite of octahedral splitting here uh works the same way um again it's just sort of flipped how the d orbitals end up in terms of their energy now when we get to also a coordination number of four which is square planar it gets a little crazy and we get a lot more splitting that occurs here of the d orbitals uh, it actually works again the same way electrons will always kind of go lowest energy to highest so you would find yourself sort of filling upward if it's a small split uh, between all those if it's more of a larger split then obviously uh, it would not so for us we're going to uh, not worry about the square planar sort of splitting because it looks a little crazy you are responsible for the tetrahedral splitting and the octahedral one that we were talking about previously uh, which is obviously this guy here so uh, for us we'll do octahedral which is coordination number six and tetrahedral which is coordination number four you need to be able to draw these things with the arrows figure out how many unpaired electrons Again, low spin, high spin, uh, paramagnetic or not. Any questions on that there? All right, that 